So my sermon this morning, I want to focus in on that story in Acts 28, right at the beginning of the chapter, um, where we see Paul spending some time on this island because they were shipwrecked and, and they had, um, you know, he was headed to Rome. Look at verse number one, the Bible reads, and when they were escaped, excuse me, when they, and they, when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. So the people there, they're, you know, they're, they, they land on this island, and there's, it's inhabited by, you know, they call it a barbarous people, just kind of the, you know, the natives of that land were not um, like, it's not, it wasn't like a, a Roman settlement necessarily, it was, it was just the people that were native of that area. They said they were barbarous people, but they, but they were real kind to them. They, they welcomed them in. It's raining, and, and they, they were hospitable to them. So here we see Paul is going, you know, gathering up sticks to throw in the fire as they're, they're warming themselves. And it says, and when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. So a snake takes hold of him, you know, and, and um, obviously it's very, it was very dangerous. Is when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. So when they see this happening, they, they already think it's, it's kind of a, a big deal that they, you know, they were shipwrecked and they all made it safely on the land because... All of them made it too. None of them died that were they were on the boat. Remember the Apostle Paul was on the ship and he said, you know, fear not. An angel of the Lord told me that, that you know, we're going to basically we're gonna lose the ship. But every soul, every person was going to survive. And they survived. They get on land. And these guys are looking at this going like, wow, these guys all just survived the shipwreck. And now he's getting bit by a snake like... They're like, he must, he must have done something bad. He must just be reaping what he's sown. He must be getting, you know, vengeance is suffering him not to live. Like, he should have just died in that shipwreck. And because he didn't, like, it's just, you know, something's just coming after him. This is, this is how they were viewing this. Now, we know that, uh, you know, the barbarians, it was their, it's their homeland. They saw the snake. They saw what happened. They would know if the, if the serpent was venomous or not, right? So I, I fully believe that this was a venomous uh, a snake. It wasn't just something that's like, you know, there's a lot of snakes that aren't venomous. They, would just, they may bite you, but they're not going to do anything. They knew that this was a very serious bite that he had because they were expecting him to fall down dead. They're just thinking like, man, this guy can't catch a break. He was, he, he was shipwrecked and now he's got this, this snake biting him uh, as he's just collecting some wood. And it says, um, it says in verse 5, And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Albeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. So they go from one extreme to the other. They're just going like, man, this guy just... You know, God's got it out for him. He's just going to die because of something that he did. And then they see that he actually doesn't get any harm. And they're going like, wow, this must just be a God because they know what happens when people get bit by, by a serpent like that, that they're expecting him just to die. And uh, there's two aspects of the story I want to explain. One of them is what I consider to be the uh, more of a primary um, teaching on, on this story of, of Paul not getting any harm from the snake. And then the other aspect is going to be one that's a little bit more symbolic going into this story and, and more meaning that we can glean from what's happening here. Uh, and, and before I even get further into that, you know, no, no nothing that's written in scripture is, is there accidentally, right? So this story about the Apostle Paul having a snake bite him out of this, you know, all, everything that happens here, this is part of the word of God. God thought it was important enough to retain in his word for, for all of eternity, essentially, for, for everyone to be able to see this and learn and get something from it. Okay, it's not just, oh, this is kind of a cool story, we'll include this. There's something to, to learn from these stories. And, and Brother Dev and I were just talking about that this morning before, before service, how, you know, you, you, could, you could see things and you often wonder, like, well, why is that in the Bible? Right, why, why is that there? Well, there's always a reason for it. Yeah. And you may not always understand what the reason is, but there's always a reason for it. So this is a pretty cool story. I've always liked this story. Um, and the first one that I want to debunk, because people have false doctrines out there, and I think part of the reason, sometimes 
I believe that God has certain stories in here just as, as a preemptive way of debunking false doctrines that he know are gonna, knows is going to come up later. That people are just going to introduce and start taking things out of context. And he, and he kind of just, he just builds in the refutation of false doctrine and false beliefs already inherently in Scripture with, with having um, multiple places or multiple uh, areas where you can look at and be, and, and be able to debunk things. And the, the first one I want to go into, and flip over if you would to Mark chapter 16. Keep a bookmark here. We're going to go back to Acts 28 a little bit later. Mark 16. It's the last chapter of the book of Mark. Because what we see in Acts 28 is a, is a fulfilling of what Jesus said in Mark chapter 16 and what, and what he said was going to happen for those uh, that believe. Now, Mark 16, the end of the passage there is very, very famous portion of scripture, verse, starting in verse number 15, we start reading, where the Bible says, and he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, right? We hear that preach a lot. We believe that a lot. Where it's, a, you know, it's a great commission to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. Verse 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So basically what Jesus is saying is tell them to go out preach the gospel. And then he's saying that there's going to be signs that follow those that believe. Now, I have my own opinion on why I think this, this was happening prevalently in, you know, shortly after the resurrection of Christ. And, and what I wholeheartedly believe is that the reason why we don't see the same level of, of miracles and gifts that were given by God, it's not that God can't do them. It's not that God won't do them again. But the purpose, there's a specific purpose why there were special miracles done at that time. And I believe it's because there was a, that's, that's, you know, for one, the whole event of Jesus Christ coming to this earth is, is pivotal, it's foundation to our existence as the human race. I mean, that's like the focal point. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, coming to earth, dying on the cross, raising again from the dead, is just the monumental event for like all of existence, right? Obviously, he's coming back, which is going to be another extremely important, pivotal moment in the history of all mankind. But it, it, it's so fundamental that um, I've, you know the whole Bible essentially is about that, right? I mean, everything points to those events. And because at that time, there's also a change made from the Levitical priesthood to the order of Melchizedek, where there was definitely some things that changed in the way that the services, in the way that the, the service to the Lord is done, and just um, the, the changing from Old Testament to New Testament is a significant change, and God wanted to put his stamp on the changes and be like, no, this is from God. This isn't just people coming in and trying to alter and change the word of God and everything else. It was, um, I believe, all those signs and wonders that were given at that time was just putting that full stamp of approval on it. Um, even though we don't need miracles to prove anything, we've got the word of God, we've got the word of truth here that can lead us and guide us, and we should be able to look at the words and understand that this is right and this is true without the miracles. But God still uses the miracles to, to help us to, to get that understanding. I mean, when Jesus came on this earth, he could have preached completely. Obviously, he's fulfilling scripture too, but I'm just saying like it could have been sufficient just to, just to preach without all the miracles. But God already promised that. He fulfilled that. And he was proving he was the son of God through everything that he did. I mean, by, by opening up the ears of the deaf, by opening, you know, the, the blind receiving their sight. That was all prophesied. He had to do that. I'm not saying he didn't have to do that. It's the way that God designed it. But the power of the word of God itself anyways is sufficient, is, is my point with that. He could have been able to preach all the truth um, if God didn't already prophesy he was going to have those miracles. Uh, just because the word of God is that powerful. But 
he proved he was a son of God. He did all those miracles. He showed, like, look, this is legit, right? I mean, he's healing people. He's preaching the word of God. He's doing everything that's prophesied. It's supposed to be done. And then after that, his disciples are going out. He, he gives them the power of the Holy Ghost to do all these special miracles where they're able to, you know, in Acts chapter 2, they're given the ability to speak with tongues that they didn't know beforehand. It wasn't in their knowledge, but the Holy Ghost is just working through them to be able to speak in other languages that they had not known previously, among other gifts as well. Healing people, we see the Apostle Peter and, and John, and they're going out, and you know, and they're able to heal people. The Apostle Paul you know, they, they have these abilities that are special abilities that God had given them. And the confirmation on the work that they're doing ultimately was done by these signs. And when we look at the signs in, in Mark 16, you know, we see casting out devils. We see speaking with new tongues. We see taking up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing. And that last verse, there, verse 18, the taking up serpents and drinking a deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Both of those are tied together. It's just talking about the safety and the protection that God is going to put on his servants that are, that are serving him and those that, that believe. And it says, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now, we have a, a, a fake Christianity out there that's in the, the Pentecostal movement that ultimately turns church into a big circus and... They want to say, oh, no, you know, all these things are still happening today. And they have people rolling around on the ground. And they have their, their fake healing stories and everything else to deceive people into thinking. that. And what's funny is that because they're so focused on these few verses here, they also have that strong belief that you could lose your salvation or that you need to be baptized in order to be saved. Right? Well, if you're not baptized, then, then you're not saved. And they get that from Mark 16, 16, where it says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And just real, real quickly, I wasn't even going to go into this, but it's such a simple verse. And when you compare that to every other verse in the Bible that you look to, talking about salvation, you're never going to see that baptism is tied into the requirements for being saved. But what this statement says is 100% true and accurate. Amen. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Well, you know what? I believe and I was baptized. Right. If you were baptized too, you're saved, right? He that believeth is what saves. Right. He that believeth, if you add anything else just describing something that you've done. He that believeth and goes to church shall be saved. You can say that too because it's the believing that saves. It's just breaking it down to that uh, that rudimentary. And also even just in containing the same verse, if you had to be baptized to be saved, then why do you say he that believeth not shall be damned? It doesn't say anything about baptism. It doesn't say he that believeth and is not baptized shall be damned. It doesn't say he that believeth not and is not baptized shall be damned. It says he that believeth not shall be damned, right? So there's nothing wrong with this verse. There's nothing untrue about this verse. It's completely fine if you understand English and if you understand logic and reasoning, how you can have something be true in an equation that even if you add other things on there. Now, look, it, this isn't talking about your faith is in the baptism to be saved. If your faith is in baptism to be saved, then you're not saved. If your faith is in Christ and you happen to be baptized, then you're saved. But that's a, that's kind of that can be an entire sermon in and of itself, just proving how baptism doesn't save. But um, be careful with people who want to just try to demonstrate their spirituality through these other means, through like the the um, you know maybe supernatural means or whatever, because that's what a lot of Pentecostals like to focus on. And I brought this up in the past before. I just spake on tongue speaking not that long ago how I would have people, some Pentecostals ask me, well, have you ever spoken in tongues before? Because that's their proof. That's what, it, to them, that's what they focus on. That's what, they're, what is important to them to see, well, how spiritual are you really? Well, have you ever speak, speak in tongues and everything else? And they look to that instead of what do you actually believe? Right? Are you, is your faith in the word of God? Are you trusting in this? Because a lot of people get, get drawn into and sucked into the show. They get sucked into things. You know, I, I think it's the same reason. You know, a lot of people 
like mystical things, right? Oh, and they, they'll go to the, to the psychics and all these other things, and they think that they, they like to have this, this extra something else, like some other proof, some other thing that they can see because faith isn't enough. They need to be able to see some other manifestation, um, and they're willing to believe in a lie. And you say, well, why do you call it a lie what the Pentecostals are doing? Because they don't have the right gospel. They don't have the right gospel. So, first of all, these gifts are given to those that believe. These gifts are given. Oh, I'm being told that I don't have audio. Everything looks like it's on to me. Is it plugged in? Just pull out the mic. We'll do it off the... We'll do it off of the, the thing. Just pull it out of here. From the camera. Sorry about that. That's why my wife is holding up a sign back there. And just like, I'm not even paying attention. Like, oh, okay, well, there's enough people moving around. Pentecostals. Pentecostals. They don't have the right gospel. They don't have the right gospel. So the gifts were given. This is, this is thank you. Thank you. The sign shall follow them that believe. That's a, that's a key point here in verse 17. If you're not believing the right gospel, then there's no way you're going to have these signs following. If you're believing you can lose your salvation, you don't believe the record that God gave of his son. You don't believe what 1 John 5 says about uh, this is the record that, um, and this is the record that, that he hath given to us eternal life and this life is in his son. It's given unto us. Given is a gift. Given means it's free. Given means it's not earned. That is given to us eternal life. Eternal means it lasts forever. It doesn't end. So if you don't believe that eternal life is truly eternal, if you don't believe it lasts forever, if you think that it's just, you know, you can just you have it one day and not the next day, that's not eternal. That's not eternity. You don't, you don't have that. that this, if it doesn't last forever, you're not believing that it's eternal. You're making God a liar because you're not believing that record. Right. And it's only through Jesus Christ, of course. In this, in this, in this gift, it's in his son. It's, it's, it's only through Christ. It's the only way you could receive it. There's no other way. So if you're not believing that, if you're making God a liar, then how in the world are you going to have these signs from God? Now, we also see in Scripture that uh, wicked people who are into uh, the darker spiritual side of things are also capable of producing lying signs and wonders. And this is why we don't want to be focused on just signs and wonders to prove what's true, to prove what's right. We went over this not that long ago with uh, Moses confronting Pharaoh and the magicians in Egypt were able to do some of the same things that Moses was able to do through the power of God. Moses is using the power of God and the Holy Ghost to, to you know, turn his staff into a serpent. He's doing various things, making the frogs come up, right? And the magicians were able to mimic and copy that to some extent. So you can't just look at that alone as being the proof. We have to look at what is the teaching, what is the word, where is the, you know, what are you basing it off of? And, and basing it off of things like that, uh, there's a purpose for the signs, but that's not the reason. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 14, when it's talking about everything being done decently in order in the church, and it's talking specifically about the tongues, like other tongues being taught, that if people come in who are unbelieving, into a church and you're all just just everyone's just shouting out and having their own tongues up, they're going to think you guys are crazy. That's right. It's not going to come in. But if they hear the word being taught and preached, then they could be convinced of the word. That this is the word of God because they could hear it, they could understand it, they could see things being done decently in order and then that will have the power with them, not just coming into some circus freak show of people, you know, swinging from the rafters and, and having just a crazy party or whatever, thinking that you're, you know, they're, they're, they're all, all super spiritual worshiping the Lord. That's not the biblical signs and, and wonders that were done anyways. And the signs are given to them that believe. But things get crazy, and I, keep, I have to keep reminding myself that I'm in the South, because I, you know, I didn't grow up in the South, and I moved from the West, but 
in, in the rural areas of the South is where you find the crazy Pentecostal snake handlers. And they'll turn to verses like this and yank them completely out of context and saying, see, look, these signs are going to follow them that believe that we're going to take up serpents. So they, they have these snakes and they get all worked up in their service and then they just go into their box and they start, you know, dancing around holding on to stakes thinking that's showing how spiritual are. See, look, I've got the Holy Spirit and, you know, I'm not going to die and they get bit and stuff. And these guys, you know, they get bit and they get sick. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times they die. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes they'll get close to dying. It's like, oh, yeah, my daddy was a preacher. He was a snake handler. And, and what happened? How did he die? Oh, he died of a snake bite. <laughs> and then people still don't get it. It's like, what? Like, well, he must have been doing something. He must have been in some sin or something. You know, God allowed him to. It's like, no. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. Is that, that's not what this is. What this is talking about is like what happened here with Paul. Paul's out doing the work of God. Paul's preaching the gospel. He's in a, in a, in a situation that's not the safest situation. He gets shipwrecked. He's in, a, in an area where you're going to have to worry about snakes being around and potentially biting you. But you know what? He doesn't have to worry because God has blessed him and because God is going to keep him safe supernaturally. And this isn't something that's brand new. You could turn to, uh, actually turn if you would to, to Matthew chapter 4. I'll just read from Psalm 91 for you. Just the idea of God protecting us. We've been seeing that a lot in the Psalms. Psalm 91, I'm going to read verses 9 through 13. The Bible reads, Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. So in that passage there, those few verses I read from Psalm 91, it starts off, I started off in verse 9 because it says, Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. Because you've put your trust in the Lord, because your faith is in the Lord, hey, no evil is going to befall you. And, and this is this promise that the devil actually ends up bringing up to Jesus Christ when he's tempting him in the wilderness. So if you went to Matthew chapter 4, that's where we'll look at next. Because the devil is, is quoting this passage saying, Hey, he's given his angels charge concerning thee to keep thee in the way. Um, they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Saying, See, look, you know, God's given you his protection. And this, this is perfectly applicable to the snake handlers of today. Because what that promise from Psalm 91 is just like the promise in Mark 16. Those that make God their habitation, he's saying, you know what? We are going, you know, he is going to uh, allow them to have these, these signs and then not have anything hurt them because God is with them and protecting them in the work that they're doing. Matthew chapter 4, look at verse number 5, the Bible reads, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. So basically the devil's going to him saying, Okay, well if you're, if you're the Son of God, there's this promise in Psalm 91 that says his angels are going to protect you anyway, so why don't you just go ahead and jump off the pinnacle of the temple here? Why don't you just prove it that you're right with God and that he's just going to protect you because here's the promise. That's what the devil says. It's the same thing as these snake handlers going, see, we got this promise here, so I'm just going to pick up a snake and try to get it to bite me and show that, look, look, it's not going to, it's not going to hurt me. It's not going to kill me. That's satanic. Yeah. That's, right. That's what the devil does. Because what did Jesus answer the, de the devil? Jesus said to him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Amen. We don't need to be testing God on this stuff. We believe it. We have faith. And he will deliver. But we don't just go out of our way to say, Oh, okay, well, let me see, God. Are you really going to, you know. That's wicked. Amen. That's wrong. There is nothing good that comes out of you Lifting yourself up and boasting in front of you. Oh, look how spiritual I am. See, I could do all this stuff and nothing's going to happen to me. 
You think that proud, you think God's happy with that proud attitude? And that that's why he's going to protect you? No. Not at all. Not at all. And it's, and you know, the snake handlers, it's, it's, it's a completely wicked, um, wicked people that are doing that and deceiving people. And now it's not, I don't think it's a lot of people. I think it's, I think it's really, really, really isolated, small groups and pockets, probably in areas where they, there's not a lot of, uh, it seems like the people aren't very educated, and, and it's easy to deceive people that are not very bright. And that's sad. That's another reason why you want to, you know, we homeschool our kids. This is completely separate. But it's not, it's, it, it's to, we still want to educate them. You know, don't, don't think that like, oh, well, homeschooling, now we're homeschooling, so whatever. We're just going to just let them do whatever, and, and now I don't have to worry. Now I don't have to send them to school, but I don't have to worry about anything and just... Whatever happens, happens. Look, teach your kids to be smart. Amen. Teach them not to be deceived. Yeah. You know, people all the time will think homeschoolers, oh, yeah, they're, you know, you don't really care about their education. Actually, I care about their education even more. Right. That's why I'm not sending out the public school. Because I want them to get a real education. I don't want them just to be indoctrinated with what the state is, is dictating needs to be uh, taught to these kids right. by some teacher that... Who knows? I'm not saying all teachers are bad, but I mean, I don't know what all, you know, they, they get all these various teachers throughout their life in their, their young, impressionable years, and they're spending six to eight hours with these teachers. And for all I know, they could be some liberal atheist that hates God, that's going to indoctrinate them with science falsely so-called, or with any other of their, their beliefs that they want to throw at them and try to teach them as fact. I don't want that going on with my kids. I'm going to teach them the truth. But you know what? I am going to teach them. I'm not just going to say, oh, well, it's too hard and just forget about it and leave them to become ignorant and not know uh, and be able to just be deceived by, by some snake charmer, some snake handler that, uh, you know, is going, to, is going to give them some sleight of hand or whatever to try to deceive them. Now, that's the first part of this story that I think is very clear it's obvious, it's a fulfilling of what Jesus was saying in Mark 16. Apostle Paul gets hurt by, you know, he gets this venomous beast, hits his hand, he feels no harm. He should have died and he didn't because that is what uh, God is protecting him from. Now, the second aspect is a little bit more symbolic. And here's what we see happening. Go back to Acts 28 if you would. We're going to reread it in verse number 3. By reason, when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks, when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. So what's Paul doing here? He's literally taking a faggot and burning it on the fire. Amen. That's what he's doing. Yeah. Did you say faggot? Do you know what a faggot is? A faggot is a bundle of sticks. It's a dictionary definition of the word. So what's Paul doing here? He's taking a faggot and he's putting him on the fire. I don't think that's a mistake either. You know, words have meaning. And I know there's a dual meaning of that word. There's a reason why that, that word is used derogatorily against sodomites. Because the bundle of sticks, the purpose of the bundle of sticks is to throw them on the fire. And I'm going to show you and prove to you from Scripture that these dead branches is, is consistently, symbolically used for people apply to people who God has just given up on and are considered twice dead before they've even physically died in this world. And I also want to just point out too as we're going through this how what's the Apostle Paul doing? He's taking these bundle of sticks and he's just laying on the fire but then what happens a viper comes out of the heat and, and fastens on his head. Now obviously we know that, that a viper in scripture or a serpent is symbolic of Satan right? A devil 
is coming out and attacking him because he doesn't like Paul taking this bundle of sticks and just throwing it on the fire. So he's going to come out and attack. And we need to be prepared when you're doing the right thing and when you're dealing with a bundle of sticks and just dealing with it appropriately and, and uh, that, that the viper can come out and attack. Now, turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter number 6. And you know what also is interesting, too, is that the world sees the attack from the viper, right? So you got someone dealing with the bundle of sticks, saying, you know what? They're good for, they're good for nothing but to be burned in the fire. The viper comes out and attack, and you get a wound from that, Right? The world sees that and they go, wow, they must, they must just be in the wrong. They must be doing something really bad because otherwise, why would they have gotten attacked like this and received a wound? Well, but what happens to those that have the faith, you, you continue through that. You don't back down. God sees you through those events. And then, you know, hopefully... You can have the attitude where they're, where they're changing their mind on why bad things are happening. So, you know, you could have an example of someone making a stand and, and on a subject like this, on people who, you know what, their end is to be burned. And then something bad happens to them, right? Maybe they lose their job. And so people, the world can look at that and say, see, ha ha, look, where was God to, to protect them or defend them or whatever? And they're going to say, yeah, he must have done it. He did something really bad. But then God sees him through and blesses him even more. Right? And then hopefully the people can see that and go, well, yeah, God wasn't cursing him like, like we thought. Um, but Hebrews chapter 6, and I also want to go over this. I had a question about this about a week ago. And, uh, you know, people ask me my opinion. And I love talking about the Bible, too. So you guys have questions on things. You know, hopefully you, you understand that I, that I am approachable. I, I know in the past sometimes people think that, I, you know, maybe I put off a, 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 a distant vibe or something. If I do that, it's not intentional. You know, I want, I want you to know that, that, I, that I'm happy to, to talk about things with you. And that uh, while, yes, I'm busy, I can't necessarily just spend hours and hours and hours, you know, every week talking about things. I do like talking to people and, and answering any questions that you have. So, uh, you know, please just, just ask me about what you think here. And it also helps give me reason to go over things because if one person has a question on something, there's probably a lot more people that have the same question. Amen. And I've noticed that a lot. I mean, there's, there's one person will ask it, but then it's like, oh, man, I'm glad you went over that because... You know, I wasn't sure about that. I wasn't sure about that. So um, Hebrews 6, I'm going to go. We went over this about a week or two ago after service. And I'm going to give you um, my understanding of this passage. I, I think it's, I think, I personally think this is extremely clear what Hebrews 6 is talking about. And I think Hebrews 6 is talking about uh, people who are reprobate. Verse number 4 in Hebrews 6, Bible reads, For it is impossible... And that's, that's an important thing right there to underline and make note of. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance. So there is an impossibility... For certain people, that if they fall away to renew them again unto repentance, it says, seeing they crucify themselves, the Son of God, afresh, and put him to an open shame. So, you know, how you understand this passage is really important because you, ha you cannot overlook the fact that something is just completely impossible. Some people will look at this and say, well, this is talking about people who were saved, right? And... They fall away. They backslide. They get into sin. Well, I mean, you can't just crucify themselves the Son of God afresh. So people who believe in this, you could lose your salvation stuff. Well, actually turn to this verse. But what I like saying then is, so then can you ever get saved again? Because almost everyone who believes you could lose your salvation believes you could get it back again. 
I mean, almost everybody, 99% probably, of the people who believe you can lose your salvation will say, oh yeah, you can, you can always get it back. God's merciful and everything. And it's kind of back and forth, I'm saved, I'm not saved type of a thing. But that's not what this verse says at all. That's not what this verse says. So if this is saying a, a saved person can lose their salvation, if it's saying that, right, they can never be saved again. What it would mean is that you get saved, and if you, if you lose that salvation, you would never be able to get saved again. If you're going to be consistent in, in, in teaching that that's what this is talking about. Now, I don't believe that to be true. Yeah. I'm just saying that you, you, you know, when you're looking at Scripture, you have to be consistent with things. So if people are going to try to turn to this and try to teach you and tell you, oh, no, no, this is why you can lose your salvation. Okay, then you can never, ever, ever be saved again. Then, then you still believe in a reprobate that just can never be saved. Right? But what I think makes a lot more sense. Well, let's keep reading here. Verse number seven. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. So verses 7 and 8, you know, I've heard people say that it's, oh, see, look, this is all just talking about blessings and cursings. Well, it's talking about two different types of people. One that receives a blessing and the other one that doesn't get the blessing, that gets a cursing. It describes as bearing thorns and briars. So the fruit that's coming from this second group of people is not good fruit. It's bad fruit. It's thorns. It's briars. And it's rejected. And the end is to be burned. Their finalization is just burned. So this is, this is definitely talking about unsaved people here. Yeah, I would say false prophets. As the Bible refers to them, like in Matthew 7, it says you shall know them by their fruits. And we see the fruit here is bad. So the blessing and the cursing, I don't think this is all just talking about, oh, yeah, just saved people can have blessings and cursings from God. No, because the saved person, their end isn't to be burned. Just to answer that point. But let's look at this again of who is this talking about. In verse 4, it says, For possible for those. So here's the those who were once enlightened. Now, enlightened means you've received knowledge or understanding, right? We think about when, when you get when you're trying to, to figure out a difficult concept, uh, and when you understand it, oftentimes we'll use the expression, the light came on, like the light bulb came on. Oh, I get it now. That's enlightening. Okay? These are people who are once enlightened, so they understood. And have tasted of the heavenly... Now, tasting of something isn't the same as, as receiving it. Right? You could go into... I, I, I think they do this in, you know, like an ice cream shop. Right? You could go get a taste test, but it's not the same as getting a cone. It's not the same as, like, getting the product. It's, you get a little taste of this. This is what you get, right? Here's a, here's a sample. Here's a taste. But you're not actually getting the gift. You're just getting a taste of the gift. And we're made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Well, what, do, what does that mean? Partakers. Well, if you've got an interaction with someone, you're, you know, you're a partaker of that. If you have a partaker of the Holy Ghost, when you have someone preaching the gospel that's full of the Holy Ghost, guess what? Now you're partaking in this conversation with the Holy Ghost, with a Holy Ghost-filled person you're partaking in that, but it doesn't mean that you've accepted. It doesn't mean that you've gone all the way in. You, you know, you've tasted the gift. You're partakers of the Holy Ghost. You've tasted the good word of God. Again, it's a tasting. It's a sampling. It's a, here it is. And the powers of the world to come says, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance. To, to be able to then fully just change their mind. If they fall away from this, if they get the understanding, and see, this is why important, or the Bible says, hey, now is the day of salvation. And when we preach the gospel to people, and if you think they understand, I think there's a, you know, there definitely comes a point where people can decide one way or the other. Now, oftentimes when we preach the gospel to people, they just don't fully get it. Sometimes they can even kind of repeat things back to you, but they don't fully understand. I mean, how many times have you tried to explain the gospel to someone, you think they're understanding it, everything seems to be going good, and then you're all done, and then you ask them, so what do you think you have to do to be saved? Right? And they'll be like, well, you know, you got to go to church and be a good person. You're just going like, oh, man, like I, I've just been explaining this whole thing to you, giving you examples, everything else, and they just don't get it. 
Okay? They haven't been enlightened. So you know what? People like that, we pray that, you know what? We've just done a little bit of plowing, right? We've been a little planting. Hopefully someone else will come along. Hopefully one day they'll get it. They'll understand. They're not at this point, like Hebrews 6 is talking about, of someone who has gotten so close to be able to taste it, where they've been enlightened, they understand it. That's not where they are at. And that's not where most people are at. But there comes a moment in certain people's lives where they get it. They understand the gospel. They know it's by grace through faith. They know what Jesus did. They know the penalty that comes. They know it all. They understand it. And they go, no. And they go, no. You know what? When you make that decision, it's permanent. Just like when you make the decision to put your faith in Jesus Christ, that's permanent. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you make the decision. So you know what? I'm going to trust Jesus Christ to be my Savior. You are born again. You're a child of God. You have the Spirit of the Holy God residing inside of you, and nothing can ever change that. When you understand the gospel, and you make a decision and say, No, I am not trusting in that. I am not believing in you for whatever reason you want to do it. You understand it, and you're like, No, don't want to do it. There's another birth that happens there. It's a second birth unto death. It's when you become a child of the devil. Because everyone has a moment. Any, any reprobate, anyone who's rejected of God, has a moment when they become a child of the devil. Just like you have a moment when you become a child of God. Hebrews 6 is, de- is describing that person. That is why they become that which bears thorns and briars and is rejected, whose end is to be burned. The decision on trusting in the gospel is extremely important. And people can't just just assume that they're going to have another chance, especially if you hear it, understand it, and just reject it. You know, I've I've heard it said, when talking about the reverie after, and you, you, you reject it over and over and over and over again. I don't think that's the case. I think once you have that full understanding of it and reject it, then there's no more hope. Because I think the people who reject the gospel over and over and over again never really fully got it until that last rejection where they get it and they're like, no. Turn if you would to 2 Peter chapter 2. So what, you know, Hebrews 6, I think that's pretty clear. I mean, when you, because we're going to, you can see in Jude, we'll see it again in 2 Peter chapter 2, you know, the bearing of thorns and briars, rejected, whose end is to be burned. I'm bringing this up because in the story in Acts 28, Paul's gathering these sticks that are dead, that are just, their end is to be burned, right? So he's just dealing with that and throwing them in the fire and gets attacked as a result of that. Well, Hebrews 6 tells us that these people who they understand, they know the gospel, they've rejected the gospel, are the ones that, um, that whose end is to be burned. And Romans 1 describes the same exact process. When you read Romans 1, it's also talking about those that were given over to a reprobate mind. It uses that word. They'd be a rejected mind. And it says that... Um, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. So they knew, they tasted, they understood, they they got it. But then just like, nope. They became vain in their own imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. That was the result of their choice. And we're going to go into this more tonight. It wasn't God picking and choosing, no, I want that person to be damned, so I'm just going to harden their heart. It was them understanding and rejecting. Because we have that free will. Like I said, I'm going to go into that more in depth tonight on how that works. But um, you're going to 2 Peter chapter 2, Philippians 3.18. The Bible reads, For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame who mind earthly things. So... Just one more real small reference to the enemies, the enemies of the cross of Christ. It says that their end is destruction, and it also brings this aspect of, of the out that they glory in their shame. You know, most 
normal people know when they do wrong and know when they sin. They don't glory in that. They're not just glorying in, in all of the wickedness and some of the worst abominable wickedness. But those that have their conscience seared, they do glory in those things. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 12, again referring to a group of people, just like Hebrews 6 was talking about a person, right, who bears thorns and briars and is rejected, whose end is to be burned. Second Peter chapter 2, in a context, this is talking about false prophets. And you can read the entire chapter and get that. We're jumping down to verse number 12. It says, but these as natural brute beasts. Brute means stupid. They're brute be They're dumb animals. But these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. Okay, that's, that's all they're good for at this point. This is what God, this is what the Bible's saying. That there's certain people that are just like natural brute beasts that are made to be taken and destroyed. Speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they, look at this, that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Isn't that consistent with those that glory in their shame? Oh yeah, we count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. And they're riding in the daytime. They're not even trying to hide their sins at night. A lot, a lot of people who are wicked, they do all their stuff at night. They don't want to be seen under cover of darkness. They, they don't like be... These people, it don't matter to them at all. They'll like, oh, just do it all in the daytime. I don't care who sees. That's a sign of someone who's just, they've gone over the line. They said their conscience is seared. They don't, they don't care at all. Spots they are in blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. And this is one of the reasons why it's so important, because while they feast with you. I'm talking about talking to the church, talking to people who believe in God. That you would think that these people that are these, these natural priests, they don't have nothing to do with God. They have nothing to do with, with you because you're a believer, because you believe in the Bible, you believe in the, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why would they want to have anything to do with me? Because they want to destroy. That's why. Because they hate you. They're going to make it seem like they love you. They're going to come and try to spend time with you and have feasts with you. And oh, yeah, yeah. But what do they really want to do? They want to destroy. This is why this doctrine is so important to understand. And it's also important to understand this because on the one hand, we want to be very long-suffering and merciful with people because God is. And we're taught to be long-suffering and merciful. And we're taught to love people. We're taught to, to bring the good news and to preach the gospel, which amen and amen. And we do that here. And we give people the benefit of the doubt, but we also just need to understand that there are some bad people out there that you could never fix. That God is not going to fix because they've already been rejected. They've already had an opportunity. They've already understood. They've already rejected. They've made up their choice and they're children of the devil. And that is done for them. And when you understand that, that's going to help you with damage control when people like that try to come around you, your loved ones, your church, that you could know, hey, this is a this is a wolf. We've got a whole flock here, and there's a wolf that's entered in. Let's get that wolf out of here before it starts to, to pick people off and kill them and devour them. You can't have so much of a bleeding heart. For every single one that you're just allowing wolves to just enter in and ignoring all the warning signs of the wolf. Oh, Grandma, what big eyes you have. Oh, what big teeth you have, right? (laughs) The the nursery rhyme story uh, of uh, um, Little Red Riding Hood. Ignoring all the signs. It's not your grandma as a wolf. It's a good story, though. I mean, it teaches there, there, you know, there's bad people out there. And we need to be aware of that. It doesn't mean we're always on a witch hunt, but it does mean that you know, when we start seeing the signs of a wolf, we're going to pay real close attention to that. And we're not going to allow uh, ourselves to be exposed to the wolves because there are people out there that are just like brute beasts that are made to just be taken and destroyed. Right. And that it's not something that you can even fix. 
Verse 13, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that come of pleasure right in the daytime. Spots they are in blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. These people cannot stop sinning. That's another pretty important look. Look, we're all sinners. And I, I think that everybody sins probably every single day. But I mean, just to have a moment, like, like you just can't stop from sinning. Now, not everyone's going to know that, right? Because that's more something that you know personally. Because you know yourself, you know your thoughts, you know what you do. But the person who just cannot stop sinning at all, that's an attribute of one of these people. that Their eyes full of adultery. It says beguiling unstable souls. So that they're the ones that are trying to trick the ones that are not very well founded and grounded. Oftentimes as children. But not just children. Anyone who's not stable. Wolves will, will have a tendency to attack children. They have a tendency to attack women who are in bad situations. Right? Maybe they're newly divorced. They have children. They're looking for a way. You know, they're, they're just not very stable. New believers have come into church, young people, whatever, and they, they figure out who are those that are unstable and they try beguiling them and tricking them because they're easier to deceive and they're easier to destroy because their goal is still ultimately destruction. In heart, they have exercised with covetous practices and there is cursed children. They're cursed children. This is that cursing from Hebrews 6. Verse 15, which have forsaken the right way. So what does that mean? They knew the right way. They knew it. They know the right way is only through Jesus Christ, but they've forsaken it. Say, nope, don't want that. And are gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity, a dumbass speaking with man's voice for bad madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. Their judgment is already on them. They're damned. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought in bondage. For if... After they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. And this is, this is the same exact point of them understanding. Just like Hebrews 6, this is, this is, I think, lines up perfectly with Hebrews 6. When it says here they've escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ... They understand it, but they haven't received the free gift. And he's saying it's worse for them when they then reject all that. And they're overcome. The latter end is worse than the beginning. Verse 21 says it, it continues on the same thought. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Because now there's no hope for them. Because now they've just been rejected. Now it's impossible for them to renew themselves under repentance. It's impossible. They had their chance and they rejected it. They would be in better condition being not saved and not having gotten to that point yet. Because now it's too late. There still would have been hope. There could have been hope. But now there's none. That's why it's better for them to not have even known. Because with coming with the knowledge and understanding comes a decision making on your part. And everyone has a decision to make. And it doesn't mean we should, well, let's just not tell anyone then because what if someone rejects it? No, the, the, <laughs> that, that's, that's backwards thinking. We need to tell them because what if they accept it, right? I mean, the whole point is to get people to understand it and hear it so that they can accept it. But you can't control what people are going to do. It's their choice. It's their choice. Verse 20, but it has happened unto them according to the true, true proverb. The dog has returned his own vomit again. The sow that was washed her wallowing in the mire. And again, this passage isn't talking about people who were saved and are no longer saved. The entire chapter is talking about false prophets. Wolves in sheep's clothing. Bad people. People who were never good to begin with and, and have sealed their own fate. And as a result of this, 
you know, I think what we see with the Apostle Paul in Acts 28 is a symbolism of what happens when you're dealing with those that are rejected. When you stand on this, when you preach this, when you let other people know, hey, this is what the Bible's teaching, that these people are just you know, made to be fit to be burned, I'm not saying we're going to go out and, and execute just judgment and vengeance on people because that isn't our place to do that. That is not what God has called us to do because God has given the, you know, the, the authority of a government to be the, um, the, the, those that bear the sword not in vain and those that are going to be the, um, the arbiters of justice. In, a, in society but even just the spiritual battle right of, of calling it out and preaching the truth when you do that when you see the bundle of sticks you say hey you know what that bundle of sticks just fit to be burned watch out because the, the beast is going to want to come out of those sticks and attack you and the attack will come but be prepared for it Stay through it, and God will see you through just like the Apostle Paul saw no hurt. God will see what you're doing, and, and he's able to keep you through those times, even if it's a, you know, a venomous, deadly snake bite, seemingly. God will, will allow you to do that. And you know this is one of the reasons why, like I, I believe in Matthew 7, 6, you don't have to turn there. The Bible reads, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, Neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. I don't waste my time with people who have the obvious signs of being rejected and that have the corrupt fruit and are just, just their end is to be burned. Why am I going to give that which is holy unto the dogs? Why am I going to cast my pearls, real valuable things, before the swine that are just going to trample on their feet and then turn around and try to and try to hurt me? So I, you know, that might be a topic for another day. I'm kind of out of time, but the um, you know Romans one, you read you read the attributes of people. Not every single attribute is something that is only apl- applicable to someone who's rejected, but some of them are. Anyone doing unnatural sins that's not common to man, the sins that are not common to men, that's a clear sign that they've been given over to reprobate mind. Those are the ones you got to watch. Those are the ones I'm not going to waste my time with at all because their end is to be burned. And nothing I say or do is going to change that because God's heart in their heart. Let's borrow that word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for all the instruction that we can learn from your word. I pray that you please help us to have, uh, to have a good attitude that even if we do, if and when we get attacked, Lord, that we could just shake off the beast as Paul did into the fire and just, and just uh, continue going about our work for you and our service to you and not let that distract us or scare us, that we wouldn't be afraid of the, the snake that wants to jump out of the bundle of sticks, Lord, but that we would just um, continue to do what's right and, and to, to speak out on things as, as they are, as your word teaches, Lord. And I pray that you please just help us to be able to instruct others uh, in the knowledge and truth from your words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.